how did a Power BI side project go on to be presented to the state government, Sierra Club, Green Task Force, and may help shape the future of electric vehicles? When you love Power BI, you use it at work and at play. Meet Barry Kresh. During the day, he's a marketing and media research consultant and spends his time using Power BI to sift through Nielsen and other market research data sets to provide insights to his clients. But when he's not working, he's an electric vehicle enthusiast who cares about his planet. He took that passion and his love of Power BI to create a dashboard as a side project. Little did he know how far would that dashboard go. It's stories like Barry that get me excited. Stories from real people just like you and me using Power BI to make a real impact. These are the Power BI pioneers. If this inspired you, make sure to leave a comment, like, and subscribe. Let's hear it from Barry. Hey Barry, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Avi, thank you. Well, I'm so glad that uh, you joined me, uh, joined me today. Uh, so tell me about uh, your role uh, and how does Power BI fit into what you do? I have been uh, doing uh, media research and different types of uh, marketing related media analytics for the mm -hmm. purpose of uh, media company marketing or supporting of uh, advertising sales for television companies uh, and web publishers. Others too, but mostly those. Cool. Can you, and, can you throw, throw some name arounds or, or not? <laughs> Uh, I've, I've worked for uh, Nielsen. That's where I started my career in media. Right. I was part of a team that was assembled in the 80s to uh, launch the Lifetime Cable Network mm -hmm. and stayed there for a number of years as we built it up into a pretty good business. Right. Um, I worked uh, for the web publishers iVillage and Makeover Solutions. And uh, intermittently, I've, uh, I've taken on consulting projects and um, Sometimes when I've been, usually if I've been between gigs and, and a couple of times I've ended up getting hired by consulting clients. But for the last 10 years, I've just been working on my own. All right. So tell me how, how has Power BI fit in? When did you kind of get hooked into Power BI? How did that come into this uh, 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 role that you do as a, as a marketing uh, consultant? My inputs are typically a lot of very large Excel files. Okay. <laughs> so I'm typically getting these flat files. I'm not really hooked into mm -hmm. any database directly. And these files are uh, outputs of uh, most frequently Nielsen data, or they yeah. could be Comscore data, or uh, web analytics files. Mm -hmm. um, and they can be really messy, number one, and cleaning them up yeah. takes a long time. And, and, yeah. So. Oh gosh, I mean, you hit it right in the head. And and here's the thing. So I've worked with Nielsen Data too, and in their defense, it's not messy from their regard, right? I mean, they they give you some kind of a report, but of course, what we want to do as consultants is you just want to consume it and kind of slice and dice it and plug it with other data and do all of that. And from that perspective, it's very messy, right? Because I've seen some of those that they have headings and all that stuff. So is that what you mean when? Uh, you're getting this data from these established sources, but they're not clean to kind of pull in and, and analyze. Is, is that Does that sound right? Um, it, yes, it's partly that, and it's just partly that it has a lot of stuff that I don't need, and it's uh -huh. not always easy to pull it apart. Um, yeah. I, I do some work in the uh, <clears throat> television music licensing world, and of course the Nielsen data are designed <laughs> for advertisers to buy advertising and for media companies to sell advertising yeah. is not designed for a, a different kind of purpose like this. So I have to uh, slice it and dice it to uh, get down to the data set that's, uh, that's going to give my client what they need. <clears throat> so right. yeah. my, my first win, if you will, with Power BI, and it's frankly, um, I'm still early in my Power BI journey. And <laughs> my most important one is that the query editor makes cleaning mm -hmm. the files a lot easier. It's it's really saving Indeed. a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. Terrific. Uh, and and so it does sound like you're doing a lot of kind of cleanup on the back end. It sounds like the way the data is coming, you don't actually use it that way in some scenarios. The scenario is different. So you have to uh, leverage query editor for that. So that's great. That makes sense. I'm just really curious. Have you also leveraged kind of the visualization side? Have you 
introduce that to some of your clients that hey i mean whatever this is exactly what you asked for this is what i've been giving you uh for the you know past uh, engagements but here's another look at that have you have you uh, had a go at that i have done some of it in other words i haven't um incorporated the entire project into power mm -hmm. bi Mm -hmm. uh, for one of two reasons, it may involve other pieces that don't have anything to do with me. So I have to load, upload my information for someone else to use. Yeah. Um, or there's such a lengthy history of files. I have some clients that I've had for a very Got long it. time. And so I'm not rushing that part of it. Yeah. Uh, but I will, but I'm gradually creating some test files and running them by clients and yeah. trying to incorporate it more. And, yeah. then, um, and then there's the work with the, uh, with the EV club where there was just a real opportunity to- uh, Oh, to oh gosh, yeah, I can't that. wait to talk about that. But let's just stay here for a little bit. And, and I like that confluence that it's not about, oh, you gotta go cold turkey to this new tool. It's Excel plus Power BI. I mean, they, they're pretty work together really well. And there's this, there can be the smooth transition or it can be whatever you want. You don't have, you can do both. Actually, there's no transition and I've liked that. And, and clearly that's kind of working in your favor too, where you can say, well, yeah, I mean, I can stay in Excel and do the cleanup and leverage all of the Power BI functionality that's within Excel. And as and when I need, and, and as I bring my client along, I can go to the Power BI front. Uh, so let's talk about that EV, the electric vehicle dashboard. Why don't you just uh, share your screen, uh, give us a look at that, and then and then talk about, uh, I would love to hear from you about the ori origins of this project. So yeah, so to maybe orient us first, to tell us what is this? What are we looking at right here? This page of the dashboard um, shows a lot of information about electric vehicle models that are registered in the state of Connecticut. So I think I should take your uh, first suggestion and just step back and explain what's going on here. <clears throat> okay. um, I'm a member of some environmental groups in uh, Connecticut, and one of them is an electric vehicle club. All right. And you know, we feel that vehicle electrification is an important part, you know, coupled with other things like uh, decarbonizing the grid if we're gonna lower greenhouse gas emissions. And in Connecticut, which is a, a significant through state between the larger cities of New York and Boston, uh, tailpipe emissions make up 40% of, <clears throat> of overall uh, greenhouse gases. So we're um, evangelizing EVs, we do public education, we do EV showcases, we're affiliated with a number of uh, of other EV organizations and environmental organizations around the state, which is great that we all have partners because we all have different strengths and weaknesses. Terrific. Now, what happened? Uh, what happened here was that um, the president of our club a couple of years ago had the great idea to file a Freedom of Information Act request with the Department of Motor Vehicles in Connecticut to get a list of every vehicle registered in the state. And Very interesting. It, and he did a few simple Excel graphs off of mm -hmm. that, but mm -hmm. I asked to get a look at, a fi at the file and I could see there was just so much more going on in there that it was just too hard to wrangle using Excel. Uh -huh. The file is, <clears throat> there were about 2.2 million vehicles registered in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, the way the file comes, it works out to about 750,000 rows. So if you're not working on a powerful machine to begin with, the thing crawls. Um, and of course, Power BI has so many different ways to slice and dice and present the data that it just yeah. seemed like a real opportunity. So we have, um, we have done two of these. We get these large CSV files from the state. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about messy Excel files, this is, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is the poster child. <laughs> uh, okay. So I spent a lot of time cleaning up those files, but as a practical matter, it is <clears throat> too difficult for me to clean up uh, 2.2 million vehicle records, mm -hmm. especially when their software doesn't seem to have any auto checking in it. In other uh -huh. words, there's, it's loaded with um, errors and uh, so errors, at least that are obvious to me. Like if you list yeah. a Tesla as a gasoline vehicle, I know it's wrong. 
uh, various spellings or misspellings. So I then extracted all of the uh, electric vehicles from the file. And I've right. mostly built a dashboard around that, except that I use the main one for some uh, denominator kinds of things. Okay. And consequently, you see two years of data loaded here. Okay. And yeah, just, just walk us through, give us a bit of a tour of, uh, of the reports that you have. So I'll start with this really cool picture of that antique Brock, because nice. one of our club members is an antique car dealer, and he. Uh, this Wait, is, that's an electric vehicle. That's an electric it's, car it's from 1913. He has an older one too. He has one from the 1890s before there were internal combustion engines. There were electric vehicles. I had no idea. <laughs> I learned something new every day. All right, carry on. That's great. Right. So, so what you see here, this page mostly centers around the makes, and this is a year-over-year -year comparison where the current year is on the left, and uh -huh. you see the different um, the different yeah. makes of uh, vehicles, and okay. as you can see, very few of them have any mm -hmm. significant amount of uh, uh, of penetration, and you can yeah. also see this is the current year. Uh, yeah. displayed in a in a pie chart. Now, this isn't just, again, this is a snapshot of vehicles registered at a point in time. So we're looking at March of 2018 and yeah. then uh, a year prior. And by comparing these two points in time, that's how we get our yeah. snapshot. There's no sales history or anything like that in the file. Got it. There Got aren't it. a lot of... Um, EVs, there are only 6,264 electric vehicles in the state as of March. Yeah. One thing to keep in mind is that um, Tesla only just barely began to deliver the Model 3 at that time. So yeah. there, there are only four of those in the file, um, although they say they have over 300,000 reservations in the state. So when yeah. we look at this a year from now, uh -huh. I think it's very different. Um, Cool. So as you walk us through that, I would also like to hear that how you went about sharing it with others and how was it received in that community and, and uh, uh, you know, spill the beans a bit. I mean, you, you have shared this uh, with Sierra Club Green Task Force. It's, it's being used. Uh, it has been seen by that audience and being used. So tell me a little bit about that as well as you walk us through. So the first thing uh, that I wanted to do was look at some data with respect to the uh, <clears throat> multi-state ZEV action plan that Connecticut has joined with uh, mostly with New England. So these are the New England states and uh, states on the West Coast that are, right. that are part of this plan. And they're supposed to get to a certain number of vehicles. And the interim goal is 150,000 in the fleet by 2025. And as you can see, we're at 6,264. And that's a 35% increase from the prior year. So I calculated what the compound annual growth rate needs to be from now until 2025, and it needs to be about 51% a year. Oh so that's the first thing we have found out is that the pace of this has to pick up. The other thing mm -hmm. that we found out is ZEV from the purposes of this plan includes both electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid. The DMV file does not include plug-in hybrid. It is not a designated fuel type. So okay. I built this number by going model by model and labeling it accordingly. That was part of my cleanup. All right. PEVs are 54% of our yeah. 54 market share. Um, so one of the so one of the things that we have done was we've been in touch with the DMV and we've been in touch with the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, that's a state agency, to tell them about this. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to work with them to get them to incorporate this in the file properly. Very cool. But uh, and and how so how have like under what the uh, circumstances uh, have you shared or presented this with at Sierra Club Green Task Force and how are they using it or planning to use it tell me a bit about that um, so the Sierra Club is uh, one of our partners in the state the uh, the chapter that they have here 
and sure. they have an individual who's the uh, designated EV person. So we did a presentation. We Well, we've done a couple of presentations. We did one at a venue in Hartford where several environmental organizations, ours included, were invited to present efforts uh -huh. that they were working on. And then we did one locally where, uh, where we're based in Westport and Fairfield County. So we invited these people to come to the presentations. Uh, we've also presented it for uh, our state representatives and our state senator. Wow. Um, Okay, and and does this like blow them away? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, what what kind of reactions have you gotten? I mean, um, nobody that I have presented it to. Well, but there's one exception. Um, only one person knows anything about Power BI, although some of them have familiarity with Tableau. Very. Other tools okay. Okay. Um, so, how, so yeah, it, how have so when, they? This, you know, they when they see these visuals, they're gobsmacked. It's like, <laughs> so this is how we can look at the data. This is really great. And, yeah, uh, yeah. What happens friend, when you click on something and it filters, you know? <laughs> and and then just the way I've got it pulled apart, you know. So here yeah. we've got the models. Um, uh huh. And if I this was another thing that we talked about with the state. So this is so I've now filtered for BMW, BMW models by filtering mm -hmm. by using that slicer. And uh, so the i3, which is their biggest selling plug-in, um, it's it's a battery electric vehicle, but it has a very small three-gallon fuel tank, which is runs the car at reduced power, so you don't get dead sticked. You have a, you have a okay. way to get charged. So the state classifies this as a hybrid. They don't even count it as an EV. So when I talk about the PHEV and working with the state on the classification, it also gets uh, it also gets into the weeds with more detailed kind of sure. direction we're trying yeah. to deal with them. Oh, and oh my so, gosh, yeah. Uh, so it's so this the looks... state and we don't know how long this is going to take. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, now I feel bad because I interrupted your tour. Yeah, and now and I'm really curious to see around what do you have on the other tabs, uh, and and I can I totally believe you when you say that. Yeah, often people when they would see it for the first time, they would go, "Whoa, um, cool!" So this is by model, and, and I see the next one is is kind of city country. Uh, yeah, whatever you think city, is uh, kind city of, county. Uh, city county. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes more sense. Right. So you're, so you're seeing that Fairfield County. Uh, has 40% of the uh, of the EVs. Fairfield County is the most populous county, but also the wealthiest county. Okay. Uh, and all of these towns up here, one, two, three, four, five top towns are all Fairfield County towns. And right. so one of the things, so we want to let our local politicians know, but we also want to get them to help us work with other areas of the state to to yeah to spread the word and to uh uh and and to and to generate excitement and education and uh, ultimately adoption uh Got one it. of the reasons that it's so fairfield county centric is because tesla was the first player in the in the space okay and their, their cars yeah. are expensive. Show, show me around if you can real quick some of the other tabs so i I also looked at it per capita. I looked at it as percentage by city and per capita. So okay. so happens the right. town where I live has the highest per capita, but it's still only about 1%. And that's based on all citizens, not just uh Got charter. it. Got it. Any Anything else that you think would be interesting to look at? So uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to, going back to make, to point out just the, the prominence of Tesla is that Connecticut is one of only four states that doesn't permit Tesla to sell directly. So that's another reason we're working with the politicians because we are trying to get them to pass a yeah. law that carves out an exception to the franchise law. So Tesla and similar companies are yeah. allowed to open stores because now you have to go out of state to buy a car, or to buy yeah. a vehicle or just do the whole transaction online. Oh gosh. So Barry, this is, so amazing i mean and clearly it I, I so i know it started off as like a side project for you uh but now it's evolved to so much and you've had such a big impact i mean all the meetings you mentioned all all, 
all the inroads you've made uh, it, and this this could really kind of impact the direction of how these programs go and how, how this feature is shaped uh, so that that that's really amazing um, this is the uh, this is a graph of um, number of, uh, of I'm sorry of EVs per capita uh, mm -hmm. graphed along with the median household income of the city so this was and this is filtered to Chevrolet and Toyota these are the two largest uh -huh. selling makes of popular priced EVs I guess I could add uh, Nissan to it and it'll wow All right. cool. so I wanted to make the point um, mm -hmm. that towns like Warren which are smaller and not not that wealthy or Hampton or Woodbridge are prime candidates for purchases of EVs it just may not be Tesla if you look at Tesla the graph changes considerably and you've got Greenwich and Westport and New Canaan and Derry and those are the wealthier towns. All right. So yeah, I'm seeing electric vehicles per capita on one axis and median income on one. Okay. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy, right? When you start, take a data set and of course you have to do a lot of cleanup and all this stuff and, you know, I'm sure define measures, but once you start, once that is done, it's so easy to play around with it, right? It's so easy to kind of do, do different views. Oh, this is great. So one of the other concerns is um, EV charging infrastructure. And uh -huh. so this is how we're showing. Uh, so the saturation here is um, EVs per capita. So we want to okay. monitor this going forward and use it as a guidepost to where uh, they should focus on placing charging stations. Now, there are different kinds of charging stations. There's the charging stations where you're going to be sitting there for a while. And then there are the level three uh, fast chargers that you want to place wow. around the interstate. So we, we're using this to help them fold that into, uh, into their effort. There's a division of an agency that's uh, yeah. uh, part of DEEP that's, uh, that's looking at that. As the okay. state is investing, and of course, there's uh, money coming from the uh, Volkswagen uh, Dieselgate settlement that's going to flow into uh, charging infrastructure. Man, this is amazing. I mean, it's it's clearly not a side project anymore. It's kind of crucial to this initiative in that area, and I'm sure the impact of this is going to grow. So it's it's pretty amazing if you kind of follow your passion, which you did. I mean, how far you can go with this stuff, and and yeah, the tool is pretty amazing. But I want to bring you back to kind of your role as your, your day job as the job. <laughs> marketing yeah marketing and media consultant and uh, so of course I started my own business two years ago and boy I have a lot of things to share about that but I want to hear your story how has that journey been clearly you do you've been doing this a lot longer than me how has that journey been and I don't know do you have any tips for somebody looking to build a consulting practice grow their clients keep their clients something like that I don't have one specific off-the-shelf uh, product that I offer. You know, I I offer uh, my knowledge of the data sets that are used in the industry, and I offer my experience with the industry. And so I try and find clients who are a good fit for me from the perspective of I can offer them some strategic advice about mm -hmm. how to approach the problem as opposed to just answer the question that they think they want to know when it really may be wrapped up in a number of other questions. Oh boy, yeah. So they're evaluating this one marketing touch point, but there are four others that are related to that. And if you don't look at all of them, you're not really going to get the whole picture. So yeah. I, try and, I try and operate on that level and I try and create long-term relationships Longest term client that I have as a consulting client has been with me for 17 years. I, I worked on their account on the side while I had a day job for a number of years. So I, I try and have that base of a few clients. It may not necessarily be retainer base, but it's just clients with whom I'm involved with in their business on an ongoing basis. And so they're coming back to me periodically when, uh, when there's another project that needs to be done. And most of my, uh, New accounts come through referrals from from these clients. Yeah, no, totally better advertising I, than word of mouth, right? Yeah. So I'm just a one man band. Um, yeah. And I don't spend any money on advertising. I just do it all by networking and uh, referrals. 
and that and, and that can be challenging because it's a roller coaster. You get hit with a big project and a short deadline. The clients are driven by their business needs, not my schedule. Uh huh. So, so there are some very intense weeks, and there are some times where it's really stressful to try and be out there marketing myself and completing the projects that I have to get done. Yeah, interesting and, though. But would you have it any other way? Uh, well. This is working, so I'll stick yeah. with it. <laughs> All right. And I've, been, sure. I've been doing this for a little while, and the nice thing about it is that um, when I get a little older, I can uh, keep a couple of clients and uh, continue to work part time. And it doesn't have to be a binary choice for me. I don't really want to stop working altogether. I, I hear you. Yeah, it definitely feels like you have more control over your life. Barry, I want to thank you deeply for the time you spent. And clearly, you're doing a lot of amazing stuff, not just kind of for your clients, but on this passion project of yours. And I'm just looking forward to, uh, you know, kind of your journey from here on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Avi.